Hello and welcome to the 42 Rugby Show in association with Cadbury Boost. We're coming live from Facebook headquarters here in Dublin today and we're delighted to be joined by former Ireland head coach Eddie O'Sullivan. It was another thrilling weekend of Six Nations action as Ireland kept their tied bid alive in, against France, Scotland came out on top against Wales and England emerged with a bonus point win after a scare against Italy. Loads to discuss, keep your questions coming and we'll answer a few of those a little bit later on in the show. Eddie, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. So much to discuss. Yep. What was your highlight to that frenetic Six Nations weekend? Uh, probably the highlight was the, uh, the craziness of yesterday's game between Italy and England, you know, the, the whole mess around the ruck. Um, I think, you know, it's nothing new. It's been there for a while. Uh, Conor O'Shea decided to exploit it in full, and England couldn't cope with it for long periods and really turned the game almost on its head. So it was, it was interesting from, from that perspective. Yeah, fascinating game of rugby. Something we haven't really seen to that extent. You, you mentioned that it's happened before, but maybe once or twice in a game. Yeah. Teams they, tend to use it as a surprise tactic, but Connor decided to use it at every ruck practically. So. What did you make of Eddie Jones' reaction? Uh, I think we have an image of him here looking pretty uh, smog about <laughs> well, it or something looking, yeah, in the press conference after. What, he said it wasn't a game of rugby. Is, yeah, is yeah, fair? yeah. Sure, look, he's, he's going to you know, try and make out that somehow he was, he was getting a bad deal out of it. They should have adapted to it. Like, I mean, other teams adapt. They didn't adapt. In fact, at half time they went in, they tried to fix it, and even then they didn't really get a fix in the second half because the way to fix it is very simple. Um, you basically put five or six forwards in, or players into the ruck, and then you pick and jam. And uh, there's nobody there to stop you, and you go through that channel, and that changes the offside line immediately, and the other team has to retreat. And, and you saw England do it a few times to very good effect in the second half, but there was times they didn't because they had only two guys in the ruck, and you can't do it with two guys because you can't resource the next breakdown. So it, they just made a complete mess of what they were trying to do. It nearly, well, it hurt them in the sense that they didn't rack up the score they were hoping to. And, um, you know, they've really brought Ireland back into the championship on the points difference. We thought yesterday they might do a really big number in Italy and change the whole dynamics of the points difference. It's back in the hopper again now, and one of themselves to blame. Yeah, absolutely. Let's just take a look at one of the examples of, yeah. of what Italy did, just in case anyone didn't see the game or needs a, a bit of a refresher. So in this instance, you've had a carry, a ball carry and a tackle. Uh, so the tackle has occurred here. Um, as you can see, there are a couple of English players arriving in expecting to hit a rook, as, as they usually would. But you can see that England, or Italy rather, are standing off. They're not actually engaging. Um, and the definition of a ruck is that you have at least one player from each side on their feet in physical contact over the ball. Um, so basically no ruck, and a ruck is what off, uh, forms the offside line. So that means there's no offside line in this instance. Eduardo Gordy, who was the kind of culprit in chief, he advances on beyond the ball. Um, but what's really key, I think, here is that Gordy comes up the side of the ruck. He's not actually approaching the tackle zone as it's going. You're not allowed. Yeah, there's a one metre radius there basically. Well, to actually, go, to actually play the ball under the law, he has to come through the gate of the tackle. The gate is at the back of the tackle. So once he doesn't come through the gate, he can't play the ball. But he can loiter with intent around the ruck as he did. Yeah. And uh, England couldn't cope with that. The smart thing they ever needed to do, they had enough numbers, was to pick and drive through that ruck and pick and drive again and pick and drive again until uh, Italy commit players and form a ruck and then play away with an offside line. Yeah. And they did it a few times in the second half, but not often enough. It was too late in the game. Uh, and later in the game, you saw Italy needing to contest the ruck, and then they had an offside line, and England caused problems. But um, they just managed it very badly. And it's got everybody talking now, and, and it does force the, pro the problem on, on world rugby. How are they going to fix this? Yeah. Because if, if next week, let's say Ireland and Wales do this in Cardiff. Both sides decide not to go to any rucks. And just we have everything's a tackle, and just guys hovering around every tackle. You can't get the ball away. It'll just cause mayhem. Yeah. Well, Eddie Jones like is just, is talking about this tackle off sideline where, um, and we've seen this in the Mitre Ten Cup in New Zealand last year. They they trialed this law whereby a tackle occurs, one attacking uh, support player arrives over the ball, and there's your breakdown. That, that's a breakdown. Well, that, that means line. they're changing the definition of a ruck. It means you will have a ruck now under those laws, without any opposition in it. So that means now. That means the, the problem would be that there'll be extra defenders in the defensive line, there'll be less space. If there's a line break, okay, if there's a line break, uh, the coming back on, on the line break, is it, is it a one metre radius? Is it the whole right across the field? Where is the offside line? Is it, there's no back foot from the defence. So there's a lot of anomalies can arise there. And they, they, they're not bringing them into the top, the, into, into the top end of the game, especially if they're keeping out of super rugby at the moment because there are so many anomalies around that interpretation. And uh, I think they have a long way to go to fix it, but they don't have a lot of time to fix it. Yeah, like the Mitre Ten Cup, I don't know if, if many people watched it last year, but it was a very different picture. 
as you say, the game has almost completely changed. No contest to the ruck. I think in Ireland we'd, we'd hate that because we love a jackal over the ball. Yeah. We love seeing Peter Romani showing no, by ripping it's it out. Not, we have seen teams be very strategic about when they go in for that jackal. We do see teams now, you know, in the ruck, dropping out of it and stepping back and keeping more players on their feet. Tactically, that's happening. But there's an offside line there. That's the key. And the offside line is, is hugely important in rugby. It's, it defines the game as we know it. Mm. One team stays on one side of the line, the other team stays on the other side of the line, and we play. If you take that, outside, that offside line out of the game, it'll be chaotic. It'll be all over the place. And they have to find a way of creating those offside lines again. It was interesting. Like Romain Poit, I thought, was in his absolute element. He was loving it. Uh, he, he was given a bit of an exhibition that he knew the laws. England didn't. Uh, he had some great lines, whatever. But you saw at one stage Joe Launchbury grabbed one of the Italian players. Yes. He said, I've formed a ruck. Pot said, no, that's not a, a legal bind. But within the laws of the game, 16.1b, I think, in the law book says, just one of the players has to engage with the opposition. Pot is wrong there. Pot, I yeah. think once you engage one of the opposition, um, you have formed a ruck, even if you grab the shirt. Um, you can argue about the what, what kind of a bind it is. But the same in the mall. If you're mauling, once you engage one of the opposition, it's still a mall. If there's no opposition, then it's truck and trailer. And we've seen that plenty of mm -hmm. times offside for truck and trailer. So Pot should have probably got a better grip on it as well. He got to the point which was not good that he was telling the players particularly English players at every tackle whether it was a ruck or a tackle yeah. so now imagine referees running around the field at every tackle deciding whether it's a ruck or a tackle and telling the defensive team or the attacking team this is a ruck this is a tackle, this is a tackle it, you know, this can be insane so they must find a way to create that offside line so we can go back to playing rugby or this will get out of hand but it's a very tricky one because you, you have to have a difference between a rock and a tackle. And there has to be some definition which differentiates one from the other. Yeah. And uh, this is an anomaly now that has come up. It's been there for a long time. It's now front and centre because one team decide to use it an awful lot. And it forces law changes. I mean, that's it. It, it was ballsy by Italy. It could have absolutely backfired. Um, I think we have to kind of applaud them. I know Eddie Jones is going to deflect. He's always going to deflect. But Italy no, were so Credit to Connor. Credit yeah. to Connor. He saw a chance. I'm sure and Brendan Venter spoke about They saw a chance... I mean, when you're playing a team that's so superior to you and you want to try and stay in the game and upset them, you have to throw a curveball at them that makes them go, whoa, what's going on here? You ever done it? Yes, actually. I remember, I think it was 1993, that's a long time ago, but playing uh, Australia in the sports ground with Connacht. They were the time of the world champions. And at the time, uh, they had a fantastic backline, and we knew that scrums were going to be in big trouble trying to contain them. There was no law at that time about a back row breaking off the scrum. Crazy it's think. crazy to think about that. <laughs> but number eight's often dropped off the scrum if the scrum wasn't under pressure and they'd play a kind of a sweeper role, they'd kind of play around behind. So instead we took Noel Mannion off the back of the scrum and we stood him at 10. So he played number 10 in defence, number 10 played 12, 12 played 13, 13 played 14, you know, and so on and so on. So there was no overlap. So when the Australians looked up, it was five on five and then we blitzed them. We just came flying up and... And it was raining as well, which didn't help. I remember Bob Dwyer meeting Bob Dwyer years after, and he, we had a good laugh about it, because he said there was complete confusion about it. But it kept the score down. We didn't beat them. We lost, I think, 13-6. But it, it made a difference in us staying in that game. And every team started to do it then. The number eight would not just drop off. They'd fill the, the slot with a 10 stood on defence. And the RB fixed it. They said, OK, no more back rows stepping off. If you break off the scrum, it's a penalty. And that's the law for the last... 25 years, I guess. Yeah, really interesting. It's going to be fascinating to follow that. I guess just to, to wrap up our England chat, um, they, they come through 36-15, six tries, some really nice tries, but are they as invincible looking as they were last year? Do you see a, a beatable team in Dublin on the, on the final weekend? I time? think they are vulnerable, yeah, they are. But in a funny sort of a way, I think Eddie Jones, as he always does, will use this to their advantage. Like, he will say, it's them against us, now the world are laughing at us, having a pop at us. And, you know, the only way out of this is for us to win the Grand Slam and shut everybody up. And, you know, we've Scotland up next and uh, they're, com they're coming to Twickenham. So we need to do a number on that and then go to Dublin and win the, and win the Grand Slam. So he'll, he'll twist that around that, that makes everybody as laughing at England. You know, we're not getting the respect we deserve. And no doubt about it, he will get them pointing in the same direction again. And this anomaly that came up yesterday will, will disappear yeah. in the ether, I think. I think England would actually love to be in that Ireland-France match. I think it would suit them perfectly. That, that's to come. We're going to preview Wales in a bit more depth next week, but, but we've got to touch on, on, their, on their defeat to Scotland, the second defeat of the Championship. What are you seeing from Wales? Like Before the tournament, we spoke about that tricky trip to Cardiff on, on a Friday night. Are you still seeing a, a daunting task for them, or, or is that a big opportunity? 
I still think it's a very daunting task. I still think, I think it's a really bad result for us that Wales lost t okay. uh, to, to Scotland because it was galvanised Wales. Like if Wales lose to us at home, they've only two home games. They've lost one. So like they're just going to get slayed at home now. Like they're going to get a ferocious stick. It'll, their Six Nations will, will be just a shambles if they lose to Ireland. So the stakes are huge for them. It'll affect their line selections. It'll affect everything. So they're going to play like their lives depend on it. They're not going to change too much. I think they made some mistakes. Their defence was poor, you know. Um, they gave away tries, but you have to give some of the tries Scotland got were superbly executed. Uh, but Wales were looking at it like that they made mistakes. They're not going to change the way they play. They're just going to play more intensity and more accuracy. They will certainly, um, I think, not be afraid of Ireland and Cardiff. They're not going to disrespect us, but they'll back themselves. And I think this game has got even a little more difficult on the back of them losing. It sounds ridiculous, but they're going to play for their lives, and it's a very hard a place to get a result. Um, even talking to someone like Raj about it, we were chatting yesterday, um, he was of the same opinion. Like he's been to Cardiff in those suffocating evenings when, when you know, the place is, is just jammed and the atmosphere is off the charts. Like that's where it's going to be. And if we come out of there, I think that's when we'll be in a position to beat England. When we survive Cardiff, I think our headspace will be really great coming into the England game. And I think then we 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 would say that we'll take on England in our backyard and see what happens. So that whole dynamic, it's not actually as much about rugby as it is about mental toughness uh, absorbing the pressure and I would say and I said this at the start I thought we'd be here with three wins we're not move on I think the Cardiff game is still the one for us that makes or breaks our championship yeah I think we picked that one out before the, before the we have a shot of Alan Wynne Jones I just wanted to briefly touch on his captaincy it's come under question already yeah. about his decision making ability and when to go to the corner when not to well, what they, do you think of him they turned down they turned down um, a, kick, uh, a three point of the tidy game you know and they kicked to the corner and didn't score, which is always, you know, Monday morning quarterback stuff, oh, you should have took your points, you know. But the innocent story from that is not that they went to the corner. It's happened before. I mean, England did it to them, and, and it cost them their place in the World Cup. Jones came out and said that the players told them they wanted to go to the corner. Mm. Uh, the kickers said they wanted to go to the corner. That's not the kicker's decision. Like, the captain tells the kicker, we're kicking the points or we're going to the corner and the kicker does what he's told but the kickers to say oh no we won't kick the penalty we'll go to the corner that raises questions about his captaincy like in that pressure moment that's why the captain is there so you mean others are making decisions that should be his well they can give her opinion you know they can say uh, I think we should go to the corner and they say okay no we're kicking the points we kick the points that's happened you know it's not there's no harm giving a decision but if he's going to say oh well they told me what to do and I did what they told me that's not being captain. The bees getting other people to make decisions from, or, or kind of. If, anyways, his inference was like that he wanted to go for the points, but they turn, they talked him out of it. Doesn't show really strength in captaincy, and that raised a question. Well, I think he was a real contender. No, doesn't mean he can't be captain. He he'd come roaring back as well. I think he's one of the best line technicians in the world. He's right up there with Paul O'Connell, you know, in that sort of in that department. Um, and the Welsh line that runs very well. That's going to be very important in New Zealand. So. He's not out of the picture, but it does wobble his, wobble his wheels a little bit. Mm. Interesting that it came on a weekend where Dylan Hartley maybe didn't quite manage the referee as well as he might have as well. And Rory uh, Best is yeah. doing a fine job. And I thought his post-match interview was incoherent. Like he, he was talking about talking Italy up and like how they're so tough to play against. They've got a great scrum and how you know they've, nobody's put them away until the last 20 minutes in the championship. Wrong. Ireland put them away in the first 20. So like he, he was in, in shock really, um, and that. There are moments like that that you say, like, this guy has got to be the face of the Lions if he's a captain. In New Zealand, it's going to be a tough tour. So all those things go to say, you know, these guys have a chink in their armour. You know, they're not the shoe when everybody thought they were. And they're not, they're not be front of the queue anymore. Very interesting to see how that pans out with the Lions captaincy. Let's turn to Ireland. Um, they're still in the title hunt. Uh, yep. Good performance in patches. What were the good things in that, in that Ireland display? Um, I thought... In the first half, like we started badly for sure. I mean, we were on the back foot. The scrum was under pressure, um, and I thought France were growing into the game. No, we, we got a very lucky break that that try was called back for a knock on. It was a knock on, yeah. but it certainly, I think France got that try. It could have been like they really the boost they needed to kick on, but they didn't. And we came back into the game. When we got our purple patch, we really dominated them. But it is the way we dominated them was that 
we played out of the tackle a lot more in terms of we, set, we ran those three-man pods at them a lot of the time, but we passed out the back. And the perfect example of that was the lead-up to, to, to Jonathan Sexton line break, which led to the scrum, which led to a try. That was a turning point. But we were moving the strike point really well against them. We talked about this last, last week and, and before that, that when we played France, we'd have to move the strike point away and be less north-south, more east-west. And we were doing that in the first half and was paying dividends. And I think come to half-time... France were on their knees. They had two goal line stands. Remember, they had a goal line stand. They cleared their lines, and the clock almost ran out. And I think they were hoping the clock would run out. Ireland won the line out. Came again, another goal line stand. They held on. But you see, the French were like drowning at that stage. And I think we came out in the second half. We knew if we scored first, the French would find a long way back. But the second half was very different than the first, and it was the weather was the factor. And when the weather changed. We were able to change with the weather, and you saw Sexton and particularly Murray come to the fore in terms of their game management and pinning the French back. And we dominated possession, 70% possession, I think, over the game, or 60% possession, 70% territory. So we basically locked France in their own backyard and wouldn't let them out. And that was the winning of the game. You saw the score was just three points, three points, three points, just tipping away from them. And I think had it been dry, we might have actually had a better dividend because we were causing problems with those wraparound plays and those passes out of the pods. Uh, but we have to stop that in the weather. But credit to Sexton and Murray for changing the tactics. I'm sure they talked about it when the rain came down and pinned France back. And France looked at their best when the game got loose, you know, the yeah, line break or a turnover. Yeah. But they still tried to play like it wasn't raining. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and they, they, they dropped the ball at crucial moments, you yeah. know. And but your heart would be in the mouth. There was a three minute, 39 second yeah. passage in the second half, and you're going, oh, God. This, is, a, this is what France board. want, yeah. you know. And, but when they tried to play the structure again, then you saw them, the passes went on the ground, went behind people. Yeah. Um, when they got the wrong guys, the playmakers, uh, uh, Nakarab, I was in a first receiver one time, and he threw the most bizarre forward pass Nakadati, behind yeah. Irish, yeah. Irish defence. So. Like they weren't comfortable in that structure, and the rain really got in them. So we were just a smarter team on the day, mm. and I was really confident. Even before, before the end of the first half, once they didn't score, like once they didn't score against us early in the second half, we were going to we were going to win the game. It wasn't yeah. going to be pretty, but we we're going to get there. Certainly, a good tactical performance. You mentioned the kind of slow start was slight shades of Scotland, uh, and one of the guys who was lucky probably to get away with um, infringing was Jamie Heaslip in the 22 after that Saran break. He, yeah. He killed the ball. It was very cynical. Gets away with it and Ireland survive. Later in the game, he has, a, he has a, a massive effect. His work rate was just huge. And even to get back into that position, he scrags Saran from behind, makes the decision, I'm going to kill this. Um, it, we're going to analyse his role in um, the... Which was a yellow card by any metric. Yeah, what he did. definitely, definitely. I, and I thought, I thought Nigel Owens was very generous to us a number of times yeah. during the game. The fine margins went Ireland's way. But let's analyse James Heaslip's role. He's a guy who people question an awful lot, but he's just so important for Ireland. And this is the Conor Murray try in the first half. You see that Robbie Henshaw has carried the ball into contact. He's targeted Camille Lopez. So which, guaranteed again, line. Yeah, which we're actually going to come back to, I think, a little bit later. Um, but you see Gary Ringrose and Sean O'Brien arriving in their roles yeah. are to be the first two to, to clear that ruck. And you see Hesip is arriving as that third man in. Um, what's really important to point out in the detail here is that he doesn't just leather into the ruck from that right-hand side. He actually gets around and comes up on this left-hand edge. And he's going to try and close that corner yeah. as Ireland talk about it. Um, so he's arriving on the left-hand side. He's, he's not actually over the ball. He's you know, nearly a metre to the left. We just see him here. Yeah. He's got a left hand on LaRue and his right hand on Saran, who was involved in the tackle. Um, so he's opening up that space beyond Murray. And as you see, he just advances up and he kind of drags Saran back on the ground, yeah. opening up literally a, a, a kind of half a metre hole for Conor Murray he knows that's exactly his role. I'm going to give Conor Murray a chance to, to yeah. get straight into the left-hand side of that ruck. And, and Murray goes over, has the strength to, to kind of to just... pick and drive over, push yeah, past over. You also see Gary Ringrose get a little left hand on Saran as well, just trying to make sure that that, that hole is there. corner is closed off. It's, it's yeah. brilliant rucking, but is that an example of Ireland at their very best in the, in the opposition 22 and, and being yeah. really clinical? Well, that, that, was, that was set up for that. The, the initial um, mismatch between... Uh, Henshaw and Camille Lopez that was always a gain line and then the first two guys to make sure they secured the ball and then he still come around the corner and just closing in the, the side of the rock leaving the hole for Conor Murray to basically drive over and, there's, and, and like they're, they're your kind of power plays in that situation I remember a uh, triple crown game against Scotland in 2004 it's not too similar we used Shaggy and we ploughed him into 
the 10 and 12 collapsed them and then they had to push in and we double skipped and Jordan Murphy fell over the line literally on oh, the outside yeah. channel. So it's the same logic, you get into that space, you identify uh, where you can, can create the space. Like that time maybe we knew someone like that, Conor Murray's size, he's like an old back row coming around there to carry. Mm. In our case we had Peter Stringer so we would not look for us like someone Stringer to borrow in there but to try and get the ball away with the space in the corner. So that, that's, it's a power play setup. In that situation you have one chance to maybe score a try without going through too many phases, maybe one or two phases maximum. And they executed very well. And you're right, Heaslip was key in locking off that outside corner of the ruck so Murray had basically just to beat one guy and climb over and score a try. He had to work for it, but a guy that size and power, and he scored a lot of tries for Ireland. He's, yeah. he's, he's a try scoring machine at half-backs goal, you know. Yeah, well, he, he, did, he did all sorts in this game. Himself and Johnny Sexton were, were just exemplary. I think we have a shot of, of Murray making one of his sniping breaks. How well does that combination work? And do you think that when Johnny Sexton's on the pitch, we get more out of Conor Murray? Um, I don't necessarily think so. I think Conor is a standalone player. I mean, he, I think, and I've said this, that he's one, at the moment he's probably the best scrum half in the world because he ticks all the boxes in the right way. His passing is, is excellent. His kicking game is superb. His defence is superb. He's a physical presence. And the problem is you, 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 you lose concentration around him. Like, he passes pass, 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 and then someone takes their eye off him and he's gone around the corner, he's gone through a gap, you know. We saw it in, in Chicago as well, you know, he was had a half chance and he was in under the sticks. That's the kind of guy that you, is a nightmare to play against because you can't take your eye off him. Like, a lot of scrum halves, you tend not to worry about them because they pass a lot, they pass a lot. He's so powerful that if you take your, you can a half shoulder, he can run over you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, but he's game managing. I think the second half, to me, he was man of the match, I think, to be fair. I thought Sexton was outstanding. I thought Stander was outstanding. But I thought for me, in the conditions, the way the weather was coming down, uh, field position was so crucial. His kicking to the corners, his management of the players around him, it takes huge pressure off the 10, massive pressure off Sexton. And um, for me, that's why I thought he was man of the match. And I think like he's at this point in time, if to pick a Lions team in the morning, he starts first on the sheet, you know. Yeah, Reese Webb is playing some good stuff as well, but I think Conor Murray has that defensive game he has. Oh, I just think it. he's a, he's a more balanced player. Webb is a good player, but he's not as composed as Murray. And that position, to have someone with that ability and that composure is massive because you put another person outside him in a 10 who's of the same ilk, who's composed under pressure, a good decision maker. You've now two quarterbacks in the field, not one. Yeah. Most NFL teams would like to play with like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to take a, a look at an example of one of those Conor Murray kicks. Uh, some beautiful grubbers, especially in the second half. As you mentioned, Ireland goes to the kick tactics, pin the French back, uh, don't tire themselves out as much as Joe Smith said. They spent a lot of energy in that first half. Um, in this case, we're going to look at a clever tactical kick from Ireland. It's, it's not just a brilliant technical kick from, a, from an individual. Um, in the top left of the screen here, we can see an early line-out attack for Ireland. And you've got Noah Nakatasi in the French defensive line. The right wing has joined the defensive line. Um, it's important to point out that Ireland stacked all their forwards into this line-out, as they did in our later example, as we move to image two. Uh, Ireland used all the forwards in the line-out, so Louis Picamos can't actually go out and defend in the back line. He's, he defended beside, you mentioned Camille Lopez. Mm. He's a really weak defender. They stacked uh, Picamos beside him just to keep him guarded all day. But when Picamos is needed in that line-out to compete against Ireland, France have got to put in a winger, and we see this late in the game. Johan Uge steps into the line. Yep. Uh, so that's obviously going to leave space for Ireland. <coughs> um, they hit up in the midfield with Henshaw, and already they're thinking of the kick. They, they've identified this as an opportunity to pin the French back. Henshaw hits up in midfield here. We see Ringrose actually getting way beyond the ball and taking Johan Uge out of, the, out of the play completely onto the ground so that he can't scamper back and cover. You see him here. He's trying to get back in and cover that area back in, on, on the back right. But Murray... Second phase, it's all planned. He puts in this gorgeous kick and it rolls yep. perfectly into touch. I guess it's an example of tactical thinking and picking out an opportunity that they had missed in that first half when, yeah. when Nakataisi steps in. Well, it's, that strategy of putting the blindside wing in the defensive line is, is quite common. Mm. But France, for some reason, used it way out the field. That's a strategy yeah. you use inside your 22. Yeah. We've set up here on the yeah. table. I mean, guide us through like, what, look, what Ireland were seeing. The, the problem for is there's the line out. This is all this space here is normally defended by this guy. By and large, he plays in this zone here, means this full back can push, that wing can push up. But you put him in the line, and now the half pack has to try and sweep back here. But it's, it's too much ground there. Normally, what teams do is they play that defense in here. So it's very it's easy now for the, the winger to go up in the line. There's no real threat here. And what your, your rule of thumb is once the first rock is hit, once the first rock is hit, 
this guy returns to short side. And that's why Ringrose was targeting him to yeah. try and hold him into the, into the, in the first example. Yeah. You hold him into the ruck so he can't get back. So, but in here, who's had too much ground to cover to get back after the first ruck? Murray spotted, did a little wrap around, pinged it into the corner, game over. But I, I'm just surprised France would use that strategy that far away from their goal line. Yeah. Like, there's just too much real estate here to manage. Lopez is such a poor defender, trying to take care of him. Well, you're still gonna, you can, he can only help Lopez. He's, Lopez has still got to stand in line. You can't defend like that. He's got to be there. Uh, so, it, 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 to me, it's a flawed tactic in that, or else you've got to play the scrum half way earlier, but then you're vulnerable around the front. There's trade-offs in defence all the time. I think that's a bad trade-off with that much real estate in the backfield. Yeah. Uh, it, it, do, it leaves you open exactly what Murray did. And on a wet day, you were even asking for, you were giving Ireland their best possible tactic at that stage in the game to pin the, the French back into the round 22. Like they were almost inviting Ireland to, to do the right thing to keep them out of the game. So it makes no sense. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the winger going back there because in the first example, when Ireland maybe missed the opportunity, Nakatasi gets straight out and drops straight back. back. Well, his position. job is, like, you're in that line. If you have to make a tackle, you make a tackle. But if you're not in, in that first rock, you're back in that wing as fast as you can because someone has to cover that space. The nine can, can help you for a while, but you really need to return and to get the balance on that short side. But like, I thought it was just a bit, bit of ins insane defence that far away on a wet day from the goal line. It didn't make any sense. Yeah, really clever from Ireland. Just, just take advantage of it. Loads of individually strong performances from Ireland uh, again. But you, you've got two weekends now until the, until mm. the Wales cash, and, and Joe Schmiel has to weigh up what exactly <coughs> Wales, Wales are going to throw at Ireland in terms of the line out, all that. Do you see many changes in the team? I think we're going to bring up your, your selection for Well, for it depends this on. on you, I'll give you my selection, and I'll be shot probably for it, but, <laughs> I, um, but I don't know if Joe Schmidt will do this. He's closer to the, I always say a coach is closer to the team, he knows best, he's the players of training. But I think there's a case to be made for. Simon Zebo goes into the back, into full back. Uh, I know Rob Carney's got a bit of an injury, um, and, and I think Zebo gives a different dimension at full back. Um, I think that gives a chance then to bring Andrew Trimble into the back three. I think Keith Earls has been playing fantastic rugby at the Brilliant. moment. You know, he's really on his yeah. game. Brilliant um, I think McGrath was under pressure at the scrum, but so was Furlong, and he didn't, he didn't have a great day, but he had a very good defensive day. He made a lot of tackles. Um, I think the back row is the big talking point, and I, like this is where the, the, the fireworks will go off. I think he needs a line-up presence um, against Wales. Yeah. I, I think there's two things here about Sean O'Brien. Sean O'Brien's name's not in there. Yeah, yeah. Not making it up. Making it no. For me, the the problem with Sean O'Brien's game at the moment, if you look at last weekend, um, he really has been a marked man uh, as an Irish player. They like they know if O'Brien gets space and time, he's going to do damage. But you know. He didn't get time and space on the weekend. He, got, he had about 10 or, 30, 10 or 13 carries, but for very little yardage. He got chopped down every time. Um, you know, the, the Welsh took him out of the game a couple of years ago as well in Cardiff. He didn't have any inroads. They know how to defend him. And the reasons we use, we use O'Brien in high, heavy traffic areas with lots of defenders expecting to run over people. But teams are just chopping him at the ankles now. And it's not easy, but they do it. It's test rugby. So he, he's, he's probably not having the same impact we want. Um, I think Omani is, more, is a quicker player, more into open spaces. That's one argument for, for, for changing. The other argument is, is a different one, is that I think we need a presence in the line as well. We mm. don't have a tail jumper, a, a line jumper that's, that's comfortable as a go-to guy, and Omani is that. Um, the Welsh line is very strong. I mean, uh, Alan jones is a fantastic line yeah, technician. Those back rows are good too. The back rows as well, and they will basically target our line-out if we have only two jumpers and put us under huge pressure. So the combination of giving us a better option in the line-out uh, with O'Mahony, um, I think Standard's performance keeps him in there. He's been outstanding. And I think, you know, O'Brien, he's been shut down before by the Welsh in Cardiff. They know how to handle him, um, and they will target him again. For those two reasons, I, I, I think that call is, 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 is a reasonable suggestion. Yeah. Um, it won't be a, Sean, it won't be a fan of mine for that. <laughs> but... Look, I think that if you, if you're for those reasons, you're going to weigh those up. I think that's why you'd make those changes. Um, but th th so be as it may, you know. Yeah, uh, and Ireland are lucky to have those those options there. Well, we've ridiculous the options in the yeah. back row, you know. There's there's so many options, and uh, Josh van der Flyer was a guy who would have come in there yeah. as well when he's injured. You know, Dan Levy playing great rugby. Absolutely. Uh, so again, we have those. We have the luxury of making those selections, you know. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a couple of questions from our audience. Patrick Cusack has been on, and he says, in general. Our defence has been relatively porous since Andy Farrell took over. How vulnerable are we there to England, given their familiarity with him? Um, well, I think you have to give Andy Farrell credit 
for last weekend, I thought our defence was much better balanced to it, and our spacing looked a lot better. Um, on, a, on a wet day, I thought we managed it very well. We never really looked like a terrible trouble at any point. Um, so I thought, you know, credit where credit is due, the defence was a ba more balanced approach. I think against England, though, they have caused us problems out wide uh, two years ago in Twickenham. The, the, they are, last year in Twickenham, sorry, they, they pulled us all over the place. I mean, they got one try after two rocks. They caught us wide, they caught us wide again, and there was a run in, you know. So I think they, they will be comfortable going wide against us. They have the power players on the outside channels just to even move the ball out there and stretch the fence, you know. So I think the, that will be a, bit, a different challenge again. Bit of a concern, maybe. We've got another question from Una Kerr here. Um, something we have kind of discussed already with question marks over both Alan Wynne Jones and Dylan Hartley, neither guaranteed to get their place in the Lions test team. Who's now the favourite for the Lions captaincy? And do you think the Lions will have a leadership group rather than one tour captain? A lot of talk about Conor Murray even after the weekend. Yeah. Um, I think Rory Best is ba back now, you know, in the frame as well. You know, I think uh, people kind of wrote him off after Scotland, you know, but I, I, I think he's hugely experienced. I suppose the, bit, the tricky thing about picking the Lions captain is you have to have a captain. You can't have this uh, committee, you know, yeah. with, uh, with everyone giving an opinion. You have to appoint a captain, and it's the face of the team, and they have a lot of responsibilities, but they need to start in all the test games. So it has to be somebody who you're penciling in as your starter. Um, so there might be a really good candidate as a captain, but you can't say with, with any certainty that they'll be in your starting lineup, um, and that's a big factor in it. But all the guys that are kicked around at the moment, like Alan and Jones, um, you know, there's maybe a shoe in to start. Although Jones is a fantastic line of technician, yeah. that's a factor, um, and he's a, he's a very good player. Hartley um, is a good hooker, but. Again, his captaincy is a very English style of captaincy, but it's suited Irish guys or Scottish guys or Welsh guys, who knows. And then you've, you've got um, Rory Best. Well, will Rory Best be a starting hooker in the Lions? I don't know. You know what, what, I don't know what Warren Gatlin's thinking. So that's the tricky part for picking the captain. They have to be captain material. There's a fair few of those guys around, and they mm. would make up a leadership group, but you do have to have stumped for a guy who is the face of the team and is able to make hard decisions under pressure on the field. But... He's the guy you're going to put on the, on, on the starting lineup for, for the tests every time. And you've got to make that decision before the ball kicked, which is difficult. So it's not an easy decision to make. Um, I think there's still plenty of time for that person to emerge. You know, there's, a, there's another two rounds of the championship to go, and they're big ones. You know, Ireland, Wales, uh, Ireland, England. Uh, you know, for me, there's a lot of rugby to be played yet. Yeah, lots of, lots of exciting uh, matches coming up, lots of chats to come in the next few weeks. Unfortunately, that's all time. Oh, we have time for today, Eddie. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, as always. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And also, a big thanks to Facebook for having us into their beautiful studio here. We'll be back next week to analyse in detail the challenge that Wales pose as Joe Schmidt's Ireland look to win in Cardiff. We'll talk to you then. Cheers.